Um, I'm humbled by the introduction because I feel honored to be here with the kind of public intellectuals I've always admired. Uh, so many of you are amongst the people I most respect and uh, it really is a pleasure to be able to be with you and to comment on, on uh, what you're not seeing on the screen. <laughs> there we go. The uh, CBC program that you just saw was uh, over a year to a year and a half in the making. Um, one of the challenges they faced was to find any scientists who'd speak with them. We went through large numbers of people, so I made lots of suggestions of, of people who might talk. And the level of fear uh, in our community, uh, and especially amongst government scientists, is, is remarkable. And at least for government scientists, not surprising. It still surprises me that so many of our academic colleagues uh, outraged by what are, is happening, uh, are reluctant to talk publicly the way Tom Duck uh, has been. Uh, what I wanted to do tonight, um, actually I, I spent a lot of time thinking of what to do tonight. First of all, you've seen an hour long, or actually a 42 minute long show with 18 minutes of commercials. Um, the challenge that uh, the CBC faced in doing this, Ole Rumek, the uh, director and senior producer, uh, and Lyndon McIntyre, who wrote the script, faced was how do you deal with the multifaceted problems with how the government is dealing with science in an hour-long program? And they chose to do it. They were clear from the beginning they wanted to tell the story through the eyes of individual scientists talking about what they were facing. Uh, the difficulty is there's so many different strands and how do you combine it into it? Ever since I left the academy, uh, some years ago, I've spent my life sort of unlearning what I learned as an academic, and that is how not to speak in 50-minute sound bites. Uh, I'm a great admirer of journalists who have to take complex matters and discuss, discuss them knowledgeably, which many of them can't do, uh, in very small periods of time. It's, a, it's, it's truly difficult. And so, um, so many of people have said to me when they watch, oh, they missed this, they missed that. There's so many things they missed but I think they gave an effective message as to what's going on. I want to talk a little bit more about what they weren't able to talk about, other parts of it. Um, what we see is a government, uh, I've, I don't like referring to it as a war on science. This is a government that spends a lot of money on science. It just spends it badly. And as one of the speakers in the, in the uh, film said, they don't understand science. Uh, I think the analysis that they don't want inquiry and data and evidence to get in the way of ideology. They're not flying blind, as Peter Ross said. They actually have a clear set of instruments. They're ideological interests, instruments rather than scientific instruments. They know where they're going. They want to get there, and they don't want anything to interfere with that, including any of the work we might do, which suggests the path they're on is harmful. So, I'm just going to mention a few elements, then I hope we can have a bit of a discussion. One of them is directing uh, public science for private profit. You may have noticed a, a year and a half ago, or it's almost two years ago now, our former Minister of Science and Technology proudly announced on the CBC what you see uh, in front of you, and that is the transformation of the National Research Council into, in his words, a concierge service that offers a single phone number to connect businesses to all their research and development needs. I couldn't believe that he would use the word concierge service. It's a word I would use to describe what they're doing. I'm surprised he used it. I mention it now because um, rather than being embarrassed about it, the government's embraced that vision, as has, the National, as has the Natural Sciences and Engineering Research Council of Canada. Uh, this, uh, the film talked about the defunding of politically inconvenient research. Uh, you heard about Tom Duck and the work at the Polar Environmental Arctic Research Lab. Uh, what we're talking about is what they needed was $1.5 million to continue the work of 60-some scientists, and the government couldn't find $1.6 million. The Prime Minister could take more than 200 people on his trip to Israel and spend far more than that. So it's not a lack of resources, but rather a clear desire not to allow this to go ahead. Now, protest does work. There was enough pressure on them, and Duck deserves a lot of credit for speaking out, that the government restored some of the funding. Conveniently enough funding 
that they can stay. We restored some of the funding, but not enough, enough funding to allow most of the scientific work to continue. Um, one of the biggest attacks uh, social scientists will be aware of was when they ended the mandatory long-form census, which provided the data set that a lot of uh, social science researchers needed, uh, municipal governments needed, as I mentioned talking with some folks earlier. It was a data set that connect, allows you to connect where people work with where they live. So municipalities would use it in planning bus routes or the location of childcare centers. That's all gone, you can't do that anymore. Businesses would use it to decide where to locate a business based on the uh, uh, demographic and socioeconomic characteristics of the population. Uh, it provided us a lot of information on poverty and where it was distributed so you could plan social policy appropriately. It gave us the best data that we have on uh, First Nations and other Aboriginal Canadians. It's all gone. So there's no basis to challenge, in fact, what the government is doing in so many social areas. Uh, they defunded the uh, Canadian Foundation for Climate and Atmospheric Science. Uh, and you heard reference to the exper Experimental Lakes area, which many of you will know about. They also obscure the funding. This is one of the government's pride and joys, the Canadian High Arctic Research Station. So when any of us would talk, as Duck does, about canceling the funding for Pearl, they'd say, oh yes, but we're spending $28.5 million in the Canadian High Arctic Research Station. Now, in the middle there, that's a map, and it shows you where it's located in Cambridge Bay. Cambridge Bay is about 900 kilometers south of where you'd want to have a High Arctic Research Station. The, re the reason their Canadian High Arctic Research Station is in Cambridge Bay is Cambridge Bay is a site that the government is wanting to develop in order to promote navigation to bring resources out of the west across the Arctic waterways. And so in the name of science and putting money into a high Arctic research station, it's really a developmental project to extract resources and allow them to be shipped uh, east. The other thing we're noting, and uh, I mean, the, the one thing the show didn't talk that much about is what all of this means for academics. You got a picture of that in Tom Duck's talk, but um, they're shifting away from funding for basic research. Now, as we know in Canada, the private sector does very little basic research. In fact, the private sector in Canada does very little research altogether. Uh, we've known that for 40 years. There have been untold royal commissions, studies, uh, panels, looking at why that is. And one of the first ones identified the, the real problem, and that is most significant research is done by transnational corporations and they do the bulk of it in their home country. Canada with the highest level of foreign ownership of any major industrialized country has relatively little, uh, few Canadian based transnationals to do research. So General Motors does the bulk of its research in the United States, Novartis in Europe and so forth. Uh, the biggest spender on, on research and development in the private sector in Canada for many years was Nortel, long gone. Uh, now the current biggest spender is BlackBerry, soon to be long gone, if forecast. So um, disproportionately in Canada, uh, the responsibility has fallen to the academic sector and secondarily to the government sector. And so the academic research has played a key part uh, and a more important part in Canada than any other major industrialized country. And the funding for that basic research comes through our three granting councils, uh, SHRC, ANSERC, and CIHR. So this government has been reducing the funding for those three granting councils. So the figures you see in front of you are what's happened since 2007-8, first full year of budgets the Harper government would be responsible for, in terms of funding in real dollar terms for the base funding for the three granting councils and for the indirect costs of research. So you see over that period of time, that seven-year period funding for SHRC has declined by 10.1%, for NSERC by 6.4%, and, and CHR by 7.5%. So the pie of money, the pie is getting smaller. The government at the same time is changing the makeup of the granting council governing bodies. Uh, the SHRC council, the NSERC council, uh, the CIHR governing council. So, NSERC, which funds, what does it fund? It funds biology, it funds physics, it funds chemistry, and it funds engineering. Mathematics. And mathematics. 
It has no biologists on its governing council. It has no chemists. It has no physicists. It ha I didn't put it up there, Chandler. It has no mathematicians. It has six engineers, three administrators, and two others. Actually, let me just, if I can, just get a piece of paper I should have brought up with me to sh share with you who these folks are. So the uh, chair of the NSERC Governing Council is a man named James Edwards, former conservative politician. And before that, he spent most of his life in the broadcasting industry in Alberta. Um, amongst the others, uh, you have Mark Mullins. Now, if you're not familiar with him, it's because you're not a member of the Fraser Institute. He's the former executive director of the Fraser, of the Fraser Institute. Um, and uh, in terms of the administrators, uh, you have the president of Acadia University, very talented uh, guy who had been a chair of the Workers' Compensation Board of Nova Scotia before becoming uh, president of the Nova Scotia Community College. Um, has no academic background. Uh, you have the interim president and chief executive officer of Medicine Hat College. Uh, and uh, let's see who else you have. And you have the Chief Executive Officer of the Conference Board of Canada. So these are the folks who set the framework for the National, S National Sciences and Engineering Research Council. Let's move to SHRC, so funding the social sciences and humanities. In the humanities, you have nobody from languages and literature, nobody from classics, nobody from visual arts, nobody from the performing arts, one philosopher, <laughs> One historian, the historian is actually Chad Gaffield, the president of, um, of SHRC. Uh, in the social sciences, no sociologists, no anthropologists, no psychologists, no criminologists, no, nobody from education, nobody from law, no political scientists. One from archaeology, I'm not sure how the archaeologists <laughs> snuck in there. Four from business, two from economics. And then amongst the others, you have two corporate people, both running their own businesses. Uh, the head of the United Way of Montreal for 19 years, who formerly was an engineer, and an administrator, and the newest member, and this is now for the humanities and social sciences, the chief of transportation heavy apprenticeship trades at River, Red River College in, in Winnipeg. Now the only granting council that actually has an appropriate uh, membership is uh, CIHR, which is filled from, with people from various parts of the health sciences, uh, most uh, very senior and, and respected researchers, although its vice chair is somebody you may know, Michael Wilson, former cabinet minister in the Mulroney area, who's chair, chair of the Barclays Capital Canada. Uh, and then you have the vice president of Pfizer, thrown in. But compared to the others, CIHR is actually quite appropriate. When you change the people who run the granting councils, you change some of the granting council priorities. And I just want to give you some uh, illustrations. So answer a shrinking pie uh, of money. They find $21.8 million for the Engage Grant Program. And from their website, this is the description of the Engage Grant Program. It's to provide money to researchers to solve a company-specific problem. Now, you know, if a company has a company-specific problem, go out and hire a scientist and do that. Why should the shrinking pie of public money be used to hire someone to solve a company-specific problem? Uh, it also announced in its most recent statement that it's going to work with the National Research Council's Industrial Research Assistance Program to assess and implement tools to link the expertise base within NSERC systems with the new concierge service. Remember um, Gary Goodyear's description? Being developed under the leadership of IRAP, which is an NRC initiative. Uh, in their latest uh, plans and priorities document, they show how they're spending money. So the first category called people is funding for postdocs and graduate students. That's down 22.2% since 2010-11. The second category is research, advancement of knowledge. 
that's down by 15.9%. And the third category, what they call innovation, now their definition of innovation you wouldn't find in any dictionary, uh, is research partnerships, and that's up by 22.1%. So a shrinking pie and a redistribution of, of how the money they do get away from funding graduate students and postdocs and away th from things like uh, discovery grants and, and uh, advancement of knowledge. If you want to look uh, at the Social Sciences and Humanities Research Council, they just uh, issued uh, on the 30th of January uh, a request for proposals uh, for a project described here as strengthening research partnerships between post-secondary institutions and industry. Now remember, this is for the humanities and social sciences. The overall goal of the project is to enhance the engagement of industry partners in research projects and research partnerships related to the social science and humanities. Uh, it talks about the advantages of uh, this and what it will achieve, increased number of grant applications for projects that involve industry partners, an increase in average number of industry partners involved per application, strength in partnerships between post-secondary institutions and industry. And should you have any lack of clarity what they mean by industry, because I, one could define that term loosely, uh, they're very clear. Industry is defined as a for-profit organization or an organization that assists, supports, and connects and or represents the common interest of a group of for-profit uh, incorporated organizations. So this is our Social Sciences and Humanities Research Council. You heard uh, the muzzling of experts. I just put this up so um, the first we knew of the muzzling of government scientists was with Christy Miller who is the head of molecular genetics for the Department of Fisheries and Oceans. What's interesting is the government's media protocol. Um, just as we have one department, we should have one voice. Interviews sometimes present surprises to ministers and senior management. Media relations will work with staff on how best to deal with the call, a request from journalists. This should include the approved, the asking the program expert, that's you folks, we're all the program experts, uh, to expect to respond with approved lines. <laughs> now, more recently, a chap at the University of Delaware, an oceanographer, Andreas Muncho, uh, let us know that the muzzling of government scientists is being extended to academic scientists because if you work with a government scientist, then you're subjected to the same uh, problems of having to have government permission to say or write anything. He was going to begin a project with some ocean Canadian academic oceanographers and one scientist from the Department of Fisheries and Oceans. And he received a letter from the government of Canada asking him to sign this doc undertaking that he would neither publish anything or talk with the media about the research without the approval of the minister's office. And fortunately for us, Munchau said, what the hell's this? I'm not doing this and uh, spoke to newspapers including the New York Times and it got written up and it was the first time we had learned that our government is extending its attempt to muzzle from its own scientists to the rest of us who may work with government scientists. Uh, the government is also quite keen to set the priorities, political priorities for university research. I'll just give you a few illustrations. Each budget uh, we've seen, so in, in the first full budget of the Harper government was in 2007. They gave $37 million in new funding for ENSER. That was the total amount of new funding. It was only for research in energy, the environment, and information and communications technologies. So theoretical physicists and mathematicians were somewhat out of luck. Uh, all the money for SHRC that year could only go for research in management, business, and finance. Now I was in the lockup with the vice president of SHRC. I said, well, you know, big deal. So, you know, you're probably funding some people who are doing research in business finance administration, so you'll just count. They said, oh no, the, every penny of this new money we have to account for can only go for those purposes. In 2008, all the new money for NSERC that year, which was $34 million, had to go for research into the automotive uh, manufacturing, forestry, and fishing industries. Again, mathemat uh, mathematicians and, and uh, theoretical physicists are sort of out of luck. Uh, for SHRC, the uh, 12 million, the total amount of new funding could go into how the environment affects the lives of Canadians and social and economic development needs of northern communities. 
uh, leaves a lot of social scientists and philosophers and classicists out of luck. In the, in the last year's budget, all the new funding for the Grandy Councils had to support research partnerships with industry. And of that 37 million, 12 million was going to the, uh, uh, the community colleges to facilitate closer working relationships between academics in the college system and industry. Now the only piece of good news is the budget, and, well, I mean, I didn't put in the budget of 2009 because in that budget they didn't have to worry about targeting because they cut the budget for the Grandy Councils by 147.9 uh, million dollars. They again restricted funding in 2010 and 2011 and 2012. The one piece of good news I'd like to think is all our protests are having some effect because in the most recent budget last month the money for the Grandy Councils was not tied. It was, they backed off for the first time uh, limiting it in this way. So who knows why. Um, the other thing they try to do, uh, the Treasury Board decided that it had 10.7 million dollars to spend and instead of consulting with the scientific community about how to spend it, it said, well, we're going to create the national, uh, we're going to create the Canada Excellence Research Chair Program. And we're going to allot $10.7 million that's going to go to nine researchers over a seven-year period. Now, that same amount of money would have paid for 339 discovery grants and allowed the um, decline in the success rates that we've seen since 2006 to be reversed. From the success of that, they decided um, in 2011 and 12 that they would come up with 17.8 million to give to 13 NSERC research chairs, uh, which, was, which alternatively could have supported 545 discovery grants. Now maybe that was the right decision or no wrong decision, but it's the decision the scientific community should have made, not a bunch of politicians deciding this is how the money is to be allocated. So I rather than just elaborate the problems, I'd like to end by talking about some of the things we need to do. And maybe you have other ideas and we can chat about those. Um, one of them is trying to educate the public about the importance of basic research and building pressure to increase the core funding of the granting councils. Uh, a second set of issues is to, I had the naive notion that the SHRC and NSERC and CHR were arm's length from government. Uh, that is not the case. The president of each of those granting councils is on a leash about an eighth of an inch long. And the government, because it appoints the governing bodies for each of these, as you could see, uh, is appointing people that will promote government policy rather than receiving government money and deciding from a research or scientific and academic point of view what is worthwhile to do. Um, find greater ways to ensure that decisions are made by peer review, not by political preference. Um, we're, we think it would be useful to create a parliamentary science officer, a person, a scientist, who is responsible to parliament, not as all of the bodies I've just been talking about who are accountable to the government through various ministers. Um, uh, just to end some of the things we're doing, uh, CET has started a campaign called Get Science Right. If you haven't seen the website, I encourage you to go there. It's getscienceright.ca. Um, that's where they got the map. You remember all those little buildings that were shutting down across the country? They, they got that from our website. Um, we're trying to have a tool that talks about some of these things in different ways. Uh, we've been organizing town hall meetings um, where we have scientists and researchers from the local community come out, have a journalist host it, have interaction between them and bringing the public. We've had them in Waterloo and Edmonton and Halifax and Quebec City and in Vancouver. The next one's in St. John's, then in Saskatoon, then Toronto, Montreal. We're going to have them in about 40 cities over a year and a half to try to provide some greater dialogue uh, and awareness raising about these issues. Uh, we've just issued a report on university industry collaborations, looking at do universities themselves uphold the values that we, in terms of academic freedom, in terms of the right to publish, and almost none of them does. The university that had the best record of any in the country in this was the University of Toronto, interestingly. Uh, was the only one that even had a half decent record, to put it that way. Um, we're going to be issuing a series of reports on the Grandy Councils. The first one is ready. We're going to release it in about two weeks on Shirk, looking at what changes are occurring and why and what the implications of those are. 
uh, and we're building a database of researchers and scientists who will talk with the public uh, so we can uh, facilitate advocacy with governments and, and discussion amongst the public. We've got to do something about what's happening, folks. It's good to get together and, and uh, share stories, but the question is how do we move forward, and that's why I'm happy to be with, here, with you tonight and perhaps hear some ideas that you may have. So I'll stop there, Meta. Thank you. Thank you. Stay there.